Enjoy a seat at the table and good company, where great conversations and meaningful discussions happen. Welcome to And Good Company. I'm Sarah Fiedelholtz. We all know a great dinner party isn't really about the food. It's about the people seated around the table engaging in lively discussion. And Good Company gives you a seat at the table to enjoy smart and engaging conversation as it happens. I am pleased to be in the company of Tony Hudson, who is the Executive Director of Blue Jacket Inc. Welcome. Thank you. So let's start with a little bit about, why don't you tell me a little bit about what is Blue Jacket? Mm -hmm. And then let's talk a little bit about your um, background. And because I think it's very interesting as it relates to the work that you're doing at mm -hmm. Blue Jacket. Sure. I, uh, so Blue Jacket, uh, coincidentally, is named after a Shawnee war chief. And uh, many times I've led into conversations and presentations that I say, without Blue Jacket, there'd be no Fort Wayne. But the reality is, talking about Chief Blue Jacket, who is a Shawnee and, and uh, fought with the Miami and a number of other tribes uh, to preserve his homeland um, over 200 years ago. So uh, that's what we're named after. Our organization serves uh, anyone with a barrier to employment. Uh, so they can earn their chance at gainful employment and uh, been around for uh, almost 16 years now and uh, uh, no longer I guess feel like the new kids on the block so um, we have a, a cornerstone pre-employment training called the Career Academy and every single client that goes through our program uh, they uh, they enter in through the Career Academy the, I guess the value proposition for our organization, the thing that I, I think sets us apart from mm -hmm. a lot of other workforce development agencies around the country, nonprofits even, um, is that uh, we don't turn anyone away. And uh, uh, they could be self-prescribed barriers. I have uh, mental illness, and many times those, those hidden barriers are not so openly professed uh, when you walk into a workforce development agency. Mm -hmm. Uh, or developmental disability, or um, or a criminal background, or I feel like I'm too old, or I'm too young, or I have too much experience, or not enough. Um, all of those are barriers to employment, and we serve every single human being that walks through, as long as they can understand English. Um, and, and that's a key word, understand. They don't have to be able to read or write English, but understand is key. <clears throat> and they're over 18 years of age. so. So, okay, so let's take a pause there because sure. I think your background mm -hmm. and how you got to Blue Jacket is very interesting. Mm -hmm. So um, now, are you from Fort Wayne? I originally? am. Okay, because mm -hmm. your mother also, she was um, served in mm -hmm. nonprofit for quite a period of time, right? For, she was in government. For yeah. almost nearly 30 years, mm -hmm. correct? That, and, right. Uh, Sheila Hudson. Right? Yes. And what, did, what was her background? Um, so her background, oh my gosh, I don't know what she went to college for. I think she was an English major, mm -hmm. uh, but she actually uh, went to law school for a small stint. Mm -hmm. um, her background, uh, she started at Allen County Community Corrections, uh, which was the government in institution um, that she was at for, I think, 28 years. Uh -huh. um, after a number of years working in and amongst the criminal justice system, her father, uh, J. Byron Hayes, uh, was a um, prosecuting attorney. So here in Fort Wayne, here in Fort Wayne, okay. right? And in fact, uh, um, something I'm, I think is pretty awesome. He was the only, uh, his father, uh, C. Byron Hayes, and himself were the only prosecuting attorneys that were Democrats elected to that office ever in Allen County history, wow. which is pretty cool. But uh, so she uh, was raised with a a, a man who. Um, uh, loved people, and when he went back into private practice, she she would tell me how often um, uh, individuals would walk up with a like a chicken coop and pay with chickens, and uh, if they didn't have the amount of money to be able to pay for his services, and so um, that's the way she tried to lead as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, I vowed in high school, uh, and I thought that I was going to actually go into law enforcement. Believe it or not, right? Although so. you although you really thought originally you were going to you studied art. Yes, well, I, uh, I did. I uh, actually got two degrees in fine art. So uh, I, I taught for a few semesters for a man I love who actually is on one of our committees at Blue Jacket. 
Uh, so uh, Rick, was that? Rick Cartwright is his okay. name, and so he... Um, He's he, very involved in the um, community. He is. He does a lot, yeah. He okay. is, yeah. And uh, so I, I work for him. I was actually a work study uh, in graduate. I was a graduate assistant to him, and then, uh, and then I taught figure drawing and intro to drawing and advanced drawing okay. and stuff like so, that. So. So, you, so you thought you were going to be in law enforcement. Yeah. And then you got pulled away by the arts. Yes. Is that how it... And then... Yeah. And so then... Um, what happened? Um, well, let me say this. I thought I was going to be in law enforcement until I started getting in trouble in high school. Ah. And then I realized I probably wouldn't make a very good cop. But uh, I uh, loved working with and serving people from the State Developmental Center back in high school. My uh, grade school principal, his name, um, uh, I almost said... I almost gave him the wrong last name, but uh, Eugene Berger was his name, Gene Berger. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was uh, principal down at St. Paul Lutheran School on Bar Street. And he would bring them up to a, a day camp, and he mandated that I had to work every summer. So I ended up working for them. And then in the summer times, I worked at, uh, before it was Easter Seals, it was the Ark. And, uh, and I was volunteering, but then I ended up working there, and I fell in love with that job. So I ended up majoring in psychology, and then... Um, in my undergrad, and I was taking kind of a blow-off class, an art blow-up art class, uh, and uh, I literally got slapped upside the side of the uh, upside of my head by the professor who said, "What are you doing, not majoring in art?" And I was thumbnail sketching out what I was going to uh, create out of clay, uh -huh. and he, well, "What is your problem? Why aren't you a fine art major?" So uh, I ended up loving fine art, mm -hmm. and I still do. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm still. Um, uh, desiring to get back into creating, but I, I love uh, my. I actually met my wife at graduate school uh -huh. at uh, the University of St. Francis, and I realized that that's probably one of the main reasons why I had to go into the field of art was Got to it. meet my wife. Got so, uh, twenty years we'll be married, and uh, so yeah. Back back to criminal justice. I I worked at Allen County Community right, Corrections, right, which relates the, how we get back to your mother. Yes, yeah. Because in some ways, I think you worked actually. Did you work with your mother? I did. Yeah. Okay. So. so yeah, so talk about that. So, so when you decided then that you, um, after you taught and you worked, uh, you decided to go and mm -hmm. work with the Allen County um, mm -hmm. Corrections. So, uh, what was your role there, and then how did your mother? Um, what was that like working with your mother? Well, my mother and I to this day are very close. Uh, we talk daily, and uh, she's incredibly close with my children. So. Um, we had a wonderful relationship. At Al it was odd. It really was. Uh, a lot of people thought um, that it wouldn't have been able to work. You know, you're working with your mother, and we had this pretty incredible relationship. Sometimes, you know, you have the, uh, the middle child syndrome show. <laughs> I was the middle child. You have the middle child syndrome show up on the job. Right. But you know what? She, being the executive director, she had a high level of expectation. She was an innovator. Uh, being in the criminal justice system, uh, a female in the criminal justice system who was really trying to push uh, the the reduction of recidivism. So mm -hmm. that was, she was pushing it. And, and pushing this was it. in the um, late 90s, right? Late 90s, uh, correct. So uh, beginning in the early 90s, she was with Judge Ryan and Judge Sherbeck and the judges who were saying, and Judge Scheibenberger, uh, Judge Scheibenberger was instrumental in bringing to life the drug court. Um, Judge Serbeck uh, 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 was was instrumental in bringing to life the uh, reentry court initiative, and and was this like the before the because uh, in the nineties was really when they started those mandatory mm -hmm. sentences and where judges really didn't have as much leeway and really the three strikes you were out no ifs ands or buts so so she was really also sort of some ways fighting as that was coming really into mm -hmm. play right well I I you know I don't. We never had three strikes here in, oh, in Indiana, okay. but um, yeah, the uh, there was always, uh, in a sense, good time credit, and and I uh, for the for as long as I've been around the criminal justice uh, criminal justice system, I've seen a lot of uh, suspended and executed sentences. Uh, suspended sentences meaning that you know, okay, you don't have to serve this time, and. Uh, many times you'd have to go through this mental calculation, okay, the, the judge just gave this guy eight years, which means that they'll, he'll probably serve one in prison. That's what I remember back in the 90s. Hmm. Um, but you're right, there was still a, uh, that was on the tail end of the get tough on crime right. nationally. Get tough right. on drugs, get tough right. on crime. It was very punitive. Throw, uh, you know, lock them up, throw away the key. 
and uh, and really Indiana was kind of taking a back seat to the state of Kentucky, which was very progressive and trying to um, uh, not just in, in the words back then were rehabilitate um, uh, people that were in prison or coming home from prison. So uh, yeah, fast forward to the for to the early '90s. I in high school vowed that I'd never work for family and I'd never work for those criminals, okay. and that was my thought. Well, uh, I ended up as I was working um, just a few teaching a few classes at St. Francis. I uh, my first job to answer your question was to monitor people on house arrest. So I was working in the electronics room, um, monitoring the comings and goings of people third shift which not many people were coming or going, so of course I was working on my thesis, and then I'd take a phone call, and then I'd type a few things in a computer and dispatch, whatever. I th thoroughly loved, I loved the job, I loved the people, and, um, and I felt like, you know, some, you, this was an environment at Community Corrections where we had the capacity, and we did, treat people very kindly and respectfully, but uh, you know, you still have the ar long arm of the law, very punitive, mm -hmm. like don't screw up or, mm -hmm. and, I, and I think that was, that's an, important. They, it, was a, it was an interesting balance of carrot and stick. Mm -hmm. um, now, when I started working there, and I think it was in 97-ish, mm -hmm. 1997, mm -hmm. 98, um, I, uh, I then moved um, into another position, which was program developer. Right. And, uh, and so because my mother was the executive director and we had this wonderful relationship, uh, I reported to a few other people, um, uh, Ken Shaley and Ed Harris, uh, and uh, two wonderful men that I got to report to, but they also said, all right, your job is to develop programs to help people not commit another crime. So we brought in these innovators from, from Canada, believe it or not, and they were teaching us on cognitive behavioral therapy and motivational interventions. Mm -hmm trying to sit people down to say, okay, what is it that I'm going through that's creating this, this uh, issue with me when I feel the need to commit a crime, right. in a sense, or break the law. Right. And, um, and so we did a lot of research, we were doing a lot of reading. In fact, at the same time, the National League of Cities came in and said, hey, Fort Wayne, you're, you're one of 11 cities nationally that should receive um, um, some benefits on transitional jobs. So transitional jobs, is, it's still not even much of a buzzword, but it, nationally it is. We, in doing our research, acknowledge that employment, education, and housing reintegration, or family reintegration, mm -hmm. and housing are three of the uh, biggest predictors to success mm -hmm. when people come home from what prison. What about, but they've also found that a lot of a predictor that's been now a big thing that people have been looking at at least the last mm -hmm. couple of years is the whole idea of, of trauma and yeah. childhood trauma. Yes. And absolutely that um, there is a predictive oh, of, yeah. uh, and that that's, so now you're talking about mm -hmm. education, housing, mm -hmm. um, uh, what was the third? Uh, family reintegration. Family, and then, well, it, but then this whole idea of dealing with trauma right, because right. It, absolutely the impact that it has and that is mm -hmm. a significant predictor of the path that mm -hmm. someone could go. Yep. So that's become more important now as a, something to look now, at. Now it's, it, it's long overdue. Right. Now it's very important. Back right. then it was... It was employment education. Right. It was people intangibles. Just thought, it was people something... just thought, eh, whatever happened, get over it. Right. And, you know, yeah. You're you're absolutely right. right. So are... then, so you were really, um, so you were really creating um, innovative programming mm -hmm. to help the prevent recidivism. Mm -hmm. So the return, the because it is what like it's over sixty percent, I think, of people who are commit a crime will actually then find themselves back in yeah I jail mean... or prison because of that they don't have the resources or means to do that. So, so you were um, creating these types of programming mm -hmm. and then, um, and you did that for about what, like seven, eight years? Yeah, I was, I was at Community Corrections for eight years. And um, did you find that were you, because you were in the system mm -hmm. and you were, um, and uh, I mean, in most in Allen County, I mean, we don't have a prison here. We have, so people who create, mm -hmm. who do really se severe crime, right? They are mm -hmm. sent to a state yeah. prison. So here it's more, um, and a lot of it, I believe, but I don't know at that time, but a lot of it now is really for people who are on drugs and they sort of are, need a place to, you know, deal with their addiction after they get arrested. I mean, we had, you know, 
Um, that seems to be a big also problem here mm -hmm. in Fort Wayne. I don't know if that's true or not. Well, I think drugs and addiction are is a problem everywhere in the country. Right, but mm -hmm. I meant what we're facing in our uh, in our in terms of our correctional system mm -hmm. here is that I mean. I mean, in domestic violence, obviously, yeah. and stuff. But so, um, so then you, so you were creating these innovative programs. Did you feel that they were, you were making a difference? Did you feel that they were effective, or did you feel that mm -hmm. the bureaucracy and the issues of the long arm of that, the, the law, did that prevent you, or? Well, no. Well, I, uh, you look cause and effect, right? Um, you look at the successful programs around the around the country, the Center for Employment Opportunities in New York, and and. Uh, Transitional Work Corporation, Pioneer Human Services, Safer Foundation in Chicago. I mean, these are all innovative organizations that are looking at the whole person saying, we're going to do this through the conduit of employment. So we piloted an employment program using those best practices. Uh -huh. And so they, they shared their information. They allowed us to visit. And so trying to provide an employment program, which was seeing success, inside of county government was great, but it's really hard to go to an employer saying, hi, I'm Tony from Community Corrections, will you hire Johnny, uh, who committed a crime? And uh, we, we acknowledged that that was one difficulty. Another difficulty was funding because um, it, was, it was tough to shake loose. You know, you'd have to go to county council and say, we want pro property tax dollars to pay for this employment program, when we would want the county taxpayers to say, well, hold on a second, why don't, why don't you get grants or find another way to fund right. it? So ultimately, in 2003, we decided that we were going to create a separate nonprofit. And um, Beers Mallard back sailing gave a uh, freshman attorney, his name is Joshua Burkhart, and hopefully he's watching this because he changed everything for us. He gave free, free time and uh, uh, pro bono service to, uh, to help us create the uh, organization. We had 12 board members that, uh, that all saw the same vision. So a city and county and a state uh, leader, we had a number of business owners that were mm -hmm. wanting to hire people with mm -hmm. criminal backgrounds. Mm -hmm. And so we opened the doors. And uh, is that how Blue Jacket was mm -hmm. formed? Yes. Yeah, so uh, it was modeling after those programs that, as I mentioned, um, National League of Cities, I kind of reported to Graham Richard, uh -huh. who was the mayor at the time. Uh -huh. And I reported to Judge John Serbeck, who you know oversaw the reentry court initiative, and the three county commissioners. And really, I, I, my mother was somewhere around there, uh -huh. but I felt like I reported to all uh -huh. of them. And here, uh, the county commissioners at the time were were just saying, "Hey, let's make this happen." So they technically sold the the company to the the independent nonprofit board of directors, and uh, and then I was volunteering my time while working in county government to write all these grants. And okay. so. I had to log every single minute, and this is the backstory. Not even my employees know, but uh, I think I logged like 750 hours, or I don't know what it was. I don't even remember. It, it could be 7,500. I don't even remember. Right. It, it was crazy because I had an infant at home, and wow. uh, or a toddler at home, an infant on the way, and and uh, and so it was. And then you were and you were working full time, right. and then you were also what I think is so important is I like the fact that you were really not trying to recreate the wheel yeah. or not trying to create a new program, but you looked out there and said, okay, mm -hmm. what is working? What's mm -hmm. in the landscape? Right. You know, who are the best practices? Let's learn from them. Mm -hmm. Let's reach out. Because I think too often people don't realize that there is a lot out there. Yeah. So I think that that's really great. So so you were logging all these hours mm -hmm. and, you know, and then to, to write the grants right. in order to get the funds right. to create the Blue Jacket. Mm -hmm. and, and so the Blue Jacket, why... What was the significance of the of the Chiefs Blue Jacket mm. that that was the name that you chose? Well, so uh, so let's take this full circle. Okay. Greg Hubner was the professor that hit me. Okay. And uh, Greg Hubner uh, down at uh, Wabash College, um, uh, he actually had three sabbaticals uh, in uh, Navajo country, and so he would come back, and I was just floored by. Uh, Native American artist by the name of um, uh, Jean Quick de C. Smith, uh, uh, Kiwa Apache, is, and, and she was just so uh, moving to me that I just wanted to learn more about uh, not just her life and, and uh, her heritage, but here, our, our ancestry, uh, other people's ancestry here in the Fort Wayne region. So uh, I learned a lot about what happened with Chief Little Turtle and the Miami. Uh, I, I, it's uh, Miami, uh, mm -hmm. it's always say it wrong, but uh, what do I know? Um, 
Uh, but I was, it was compelling, this uh, blue jacket, is, uh, it, it's, it gives great imagery. People really don't know what to associate it with, but the, uh, 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 the chief would wear a blue linseed coat in battle, and he wear it all, all over the place, and he subsequently got the name Blue Jacket. So there's some really cool stories, backstories, wrong and right, mm -hmm. about his life. Uh, they actually had an outdoor drama in Xenia, Ohio about it, and um, uh, yeah, he was a stud. So I thought, hey, Blue Jacket, it really kind of rings. Back then, uh, in the early 2000s, it seemed like every nonprofit was created under the sun. I don't know if the IRS was just making it easy or something, but it was, uh, you know, I, I didn't want something cliche uh -huh. or an acronym. Right. It just felt like er there was there was a nonprofit popping up literally every right. week. Well, you wanted also to build a brand, an identity. Right. I mean, it's, yeah. I mean, we were talking about before we started this whole idea that you, a nonprofit is nonprofit by IRS yeah. standards only. Mm -hmm. I mean, but you have to not only look at the the services that you need to provide because there's a need for them, which is really any really product. Mm -hmm. and the first thing everybody starts with, well, what's the need yeah. and what's the problem you're going to solve? Mm -hmm. And so to give it that identity and not to just mm -hmm. say that you're a nonprofit in yeah. a way. And it was, it, it was an easy sell to the commissioners. It was an easy sell to the board of directors when we said, hey, there's an 80% employment rate for people who have been to prison, regardless of whatever crime it is. So we were, we were finding jobs for people convicted of murder. And for so long, people, and it would, used to just grate on me. I don't know why it would grate on me, but uh, people would make an introduction. Oh, here's Tony from Blue Jacket, and he helps nonviolent, non-sex offenders find jobs. And I thought, when did that ever come into the equation? When was that ever discussed? Because we'd never ruled out, since the time Blue Jacket ever started, what type of criminal background we would we would accept and not mm -hmm. accept. Mm -hmm. It almost seems like a disservice to go into business and say, yeah, we're going to serve you because you have a nonviolent offense, but we're not going to serve you because you have a violent offense and you pose more risk to us and the company. Hmm. In fact, those with uh, a, a serious violent offense, mm -hmm. one offense, is statistically less likely to commit a new crime and statistically more likely to, re to retain employment than someone who has a series of mistakes. Or like petty crime, For right? For petty yeah, crime, right. a small misdemeanor. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So um, so the whole idea of Blue Jacket, though, did it originally start with helping people? Um, was it always targeted to everybody, like to get, you know, who needs employment? Mm -hmm. Or was it targeted to those who uh, really needed a second chance mm -hmm. and then evolved? I mean, how did, when you started, because you were working mm -hmm. in the corrections, mm -hmm. was that where you originally started? Or mm -hmm. we had, well, When we started, and, and I read the application of the IRS the other day because I m wanted to make sure that I was factual with this, but when we made application, part of our program plan was within the first seven years of being in, in business, we were going to open up the doors to anyone with a barrier. When people heard that we were creating this, this program, mm -hmm this Career Academy program, which was almost in a sense life transformational. Okay. It really is not a magic bullet program. It's not the magic sauce that changes everything in the world. But what it does is it builds someone's confidence. Okay. It helps reorganize their thinking, it helps structure them. And what it does is it implements all of those hidden rules people don't get when they walk on the job or if they've never had a job. It's all those hidden rules okay. that institutions of employment and education expect. They're, the, they're, in a sense, the middle class hidden rules right. that people don't really normally talk about. Now, traditionally, though, if you, um, if you, if you served your time mm -hmm. and, and then you were re rehabilitated, in mm -hmm. a sense, and then you're on probation, I mean, and they all, you know, your probation, they, don't, they, don't they help you get a job? Mm -hmm. I mean, isn't that part of what the services that they're mm -hmm. supposed to give you as you're re-entering into society to help you find housing and get your education, mm -hmm. get a job. Mm -hmm. um, so were you working up parallel to those or did you feel that they weren't doing it or did you feel that the way they were doing it wasn't effective? So you went and created this new um, way of thinking about this? That answer is so complex. So let me go back to, we had an anticipation to open seven years into our, okay. in, into our, into our business because okay. there were a number of halfway houses that were saying, hey, what you're doing, that's really awesome. It's okay. really impactful, and you're getting a lot of people jobs. That's okay. awesome. So we want to be a part of that. One second, because mm -hmm. what I want to understand is what exactly were you doing? Like, sure. was it one-on-one? -on -one? Is it therapy? I mean, what exactly mm -hmm. 
entails, especially in your academy. Right, right. What is it that you actually are doing that, that's Good question. Different? That's wonderful. So the Career Academy, uh, back then it was called the Employment Academy. They're in a classroom setting. Everyone arrives on time, with a, dressed in a business suit or dress, um, with assignments complete. If they can't read or write, then we assign tutors to them. Okay. And is there recourse? Like, as you said, yes. it's the carrot and the stick. So is this, right. is this how you worked with judges who said this is a condition of your probation? Or was this, um, or they just would get thrown out of the program? I mean, how, how did that, to get them to show up and do what they were supposed mm. to? And Yeah, so I guess there is a different motivation for someone. There may be a different motivation for someone who is active in the criminal justice system. There may, so back then, we didn't assess the difference. We didn't have a uh, control study or anything like that. Uh, but yeah, I get, it's it's hard to imagine what the uh, what the motivations would be. But yeah, it's it's uh, having a w one thing that we've never done is have a judge actually order someone to the program. Okay. We don't want people ordered to a program because when I'm ordered to do something, I do the opposite. Right. So uh, so I acknowledge that. Right. But do they get rewards for it? Like. Because I know, like some people don't realize, like if you're put under house arrest or something, mm -hmm. you have to pay for that monitor. Like yes. that, you're, they paid those. The That's criminals right. paid for you, yeah. or they have to pay court fees, mm -hmm. or I mean, there's a, or even if they're in jail, they have to pay right. back all those fees. Mm -hmm. So not only when they come out, do, are they do they yeah. not have the opportunity of a job? They're also in debt. Right. So are there ways, like if they do your program or things mm -hmm. like that, that? What's the what's the carrot? So let's go back to community corrections. Okay. It's uh, one of those real economic decisions to say we have about 30% employment of all the people coming home from prison. Now, community corrections back then was serving people at front end, so they were sanctioned to the program on house arrest, and they had people coming home back end. Okay. And it was really neat how there was a hybrid of parole, probation, community corrections, as well as mental health and uh, the faith-based community under the Ranch Record Initiative. I don't want to undervalue the uh, Ranch Record Initiative. Mm -hmm. That's where we had a lot of our eggs in that basket in 2001 is when it all started. So post 9-11, we know employment was through the roof. So if only 30% of the people coming home from prison were employed, how are they going to pay those home detention fees or court fees or restitution to their victims, right? How are mm -hmm. they going to do that if they're unemployed and, right. and we cultivate unemployment? Wouldn't we best be served by preparing them and developing and putting them into jobs. And okay. so the, the byproduct was 80%. So 30 to 80%, again, cause and effect. Proof is in the pudding. Right. They were paying their fees because they had jobs. They had jobs because we developed okay. them. And so do we still have this really great integrated whole system that you were telling me about um, in 2001? Is, do we still have that today? I Well, it's changed. Okay. Uh, but I, the Ranch Record Initiative is still around. Uh -huh. um, I know the courts are, I mean, they have some pretty incredible leaders, some mm -hmm. pretty incredible judges. Okay. So the, the very interesting thing, since the moment that I left the county, I have been full bore into serving uh, anyone okay. with a barrier to employment. Okay. Rewind back to when I was in high school. Uh, it, I thought there's a, there's a number of people out there that don't want to be in a sheltered workshop twisting widgets together all right. day long. Right. So there are people with hidden disabilities that say, I'm viable too. I want to work. Right. And who's touching them? Who's, who's reaching out right. and, and pulling them in and saying, we can make you a productive human being. So what's the, what's the, what's the career academy? What do we do? Right. Because you, basically you have people with lots of different levels, lots of different mm -hmm. skills, right. lots of different backgrounds. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. And we throw everyone into one room. Okay. So you can imagine what kind of environment that's in. Okay. But it, it, it is the most powerful uh, testimony to transformation that you could ever imagine. So you have someone with three college degrees sitting here, and mm -hmm. then you have someone who dropped out of the third grade sitting here, mm -hmm. someone with face tattoos behind you, and someone who has been, um, I don't know, in 500 different jobs sitting in front of mm -hmm. you, but everyone was presenting a barrier. Which is that so, they could not get a job. They could not get so a job. So you start with the commonality. Right. Okay. Right. And so uh, so we piloted the Career Academy, then the Employment Academy at Community Corrections, spun that out, we bought it. Um, uh, I was on the board, then I became the executive director. Uh, the board, uh, yeah, hired me and, and made that happen. Uh, so what does it look like today in 2021? And um, 
the Career Academy still is, is the purveyor of soft skill training. We, uh, we entertained a few times with uh, government grants and other mm -hmm. types of grants mm -hmm. that we would get into actual industries um, or actual uh, trades or crafts. Mm -hmm. uh, and what that does is really uh, pigeonhole our focus and who we prepare for what industry. Mm -hmm. Meaning we got into, we got into construction mm -hmm. one time. We got into welding, mm -hmm. uh, but then there's a lot of other people over here saying, hey, I want to get into light industrial, or I want to become an office clerk, or I want to get mm -hmm. into mm -hmm. accounting. Mm -hmm. uh, if we're focused over uh, on construction, it's very difficult for us right. to serve everyone else that wants right. other type of um, work. So uh, like the other best practice programs, we focus on transferable soft skills. Okay, so you mentioned uh, sort of some of those hidden middle uh, you know, uh, mm -hmm. middle income kind of cues. Mm -hmm. What's an example of one that, that uh, you have to emphasize or, or sort of uh, that you teach? Well, really good question. So I, I knew that my little phone in the case that my daughter likes to make fun of me, I had it up here. The cue to have it up here means that this could become more important than you. So, okay. of course, I put it down over here right. to make sure that and you saw me turn it right. off. But most people don't do that anyway. I yeah. mean, that's well, a cue. Everybody, uh, that's well, something everybody needs to learn. But, I that's, mean, but that's what Blue Jacket teaches. That's what we learn. So are you teaching, the, are you teaching what they call the emotional um, EQ kinds oh, like of in, things? Emotional intelligence yeah, type thing. Yeah, like being aware of those mm -hmm. kinds of cues. Or is it also, though, I would think it's also the pragmatic, mm -hmm. like if it's filling out a job application right. or you know, when they, you know, what to, to ask or what to do when you get the job mm -hmm. or, you know. So we, uh, we're focusing so our soft skills okay. on, the, on the pragmatic, actual life skills that are transferable wherever they go in life. Okay. So if they're going to search for a job in Anchorage, Alaska, it's going to be a very similar approach to how they're going to search for a job here in okay. Fort Wayne, Indiana. Okay. And so they're going to learn how, how to fill out an application. They're going to learn how to interview. They're going to learn how to get their put their best foot forward, okay. how to make a first impression. Unfortunately, I'm wearing a polo because I'm going to be doing some manual labor a little bit right, later today, right, and I apologize. Right. But normally, well, you're also wearing one for blue jacket. Yes, I am. Right. Hopefully, I'm right. representing. But, right. but normally, I, I'd wear a tie. And so, right. uh, so that's also how you got into, mm -hmm. which we can parlay into the clothing, because yes. You know, unfortunately, people do assess how people mm -hmm. look as to you know what they can do, or so mm -hmm. getting like people dr like dress for success, or mm -hmm. helping um, you know people get properly dressed for work or That's for right. an interview to get those clothing. That also became part of what you mm -hmm. sort of bridged out into as well. Yeah, and that all organically exploded. And we we meant for it to be a clothing bank. And it continued. People found out about it, found out about who we served, and they fell in love with it. A lot of attorneys downtown, criminal, criminal defense attorneys, right. uh, they loved it. And so they started donating their own clothes, their own suits, their own dresses, blouses, ties, and everything kept coming in. And then it swelled so much that, and we've given away clothes to our students from the very beginning. So they get about a, a week's worth of clothes to be able to go out in interviews, but, but more importantly, to attend class. So they're gonna they're gonna have their tie dress uh, right. or or, or uh, put on the right way, right. and uh, and if they're if if they're not dressed appropriately, they're given a point, mm -hmm. uh, or if they show up up to ten minutes late, they're given a point. And what are, and what are these points? Uh, uh, two points, you're you're terminated, which means we're a second chance organization. You can come yeah. back a limitless uh, amount of times, but you still have to jump through the hoops. What you're telling us is that you're not ready for work. If you can't show up to on uh, to our class on time as we are then lobbying for you to the, what, 68 employers that are mm -hmm. actively hiring through mm -hmm. Blue Jacket right now, if we're lobbying for you and you can't put your best foot forward with us, it's kind of difficult. Okay. We've had a number of nonprofits say, why don't you meet them where they are? Why don't you give them a little bit more flexibility? The, the thing employer is, is not going to give them more flexibility. They're not. They're not. And they're not expecting us to either. No, it's like when I teach students in journalism, the mm -hmm. deadline's the deadline. Right. It's a deadline for a reason. That's There's right. no flexibility there. Yeah. Either you get put to print or you either don't. Either you do it or you don't. Right. I can't, yeah. It's, yeah. And, and that's uh, one of those hidden middle class rules. You're either on time or you're not. Right. So we try to teach either you're early or you're on right, time. Right, because well, in Fort Wayne, like everywhere else I've lived, like there's always what I call the grace period, yeah. which is, you know, because of the, the subway or traffic. Right. Here, if you are on time, you're late. Right. Like I have learned that if I am not going to be there five to ten minutes that I need to call and say, right. I'm on my way. Because, right. yeah, people hear it. And that I didn't know that until it, I got 
that really from meeting. You know, I would show up like sometimes late, or I, would, you know, and it did not go well. <laughs> so I learned that one. So you also yeah. have to be able to read the area yeah. or the yeah. culture. Yeah. Yeah. So you know, we have individuals, as I was mentioning, that would be sitting around me. Everyone has to learn how to tell their story, and that's all part of the pitch. It's all part of learning how to talk about who you are and how you're an asset to that company in an mm -hmm. interview. Mm -hmm. But we don't want to be blackballed on an application because I have a criminal background or because I've never worked before. In fact, my son's going through the same thing. He works at a fast food joint right now, but he applied for a couple other jobs, but he's only worked at a fast food joint for about three months. Right. He keeps getting denied. Right. Well, that's that old catch-22. Yeah. You know, they say you need experience, but then how do you, you can't get the experience. Right. How, and then you, it's a, yeah. I mean, people, at some point, they have to sort of mm -hmm. look at and say, okay, we're going to give them, you know. Right. Right. That's our value. And so that is where 15 years ago we've been wanting to build, and we're, we're getting there. Okay. So how are we getting there? Well, that clothing bank turned into a store. Right. And we have five employees there that are all Blue Jacket graduates. So not only are we giving free clothes to the students, we're selling really nice clothes to the general public. Yeah, In very fact, nice. I have shoes on that I bought from there. No, no, I was looking online, and you had, <laughs> um, I mean, you had uh, a St. John jacket. You had um, some coach stuff. I mean, I was looking just to see what you were selling online. I mean, mm -hmm. obviously, it's not as robust as, but no, I mean, and I sort of think this whole thing about um, it also, if you want to, the secret is uh, knowing where the thrift st or stores are located, mm -hmm. because it's whoever in, we used to in Miami there were certain like um, places stores you would go to because of the women who lived in that area would, yes because they go to, they drop off at the easiest place yeah so what you would find yeah mm -hmm. you're absolutely right and and, and you had I, stuff you had some stuff that you even to have the, t the tag still on it I mean which mm -hmm. is you know so but that gives you a way where also then you're creating not only are you helping them prepare mm -hmm. for employment but you're also creating avenues to give them employment right, right so that it makes it you know or maybe for those who might be a little harder to place or right. someone that you can have a job for them and you so you've created your own um, basically yep. businesses right which also as we talked about that a mm -hmm. nonprofit has to make money right so now you've also got a, um, a way to mm -hmm. um, not only help your clients but also to help the organization right. and then you also are helping the environment because mm -hmm. the worst thing in landfills are clothing materials right, right. so you're really um, making that really a win-win mm -hmm. as well yeah it is um, it is our ultimate goal that uh, and this was through a strategic planning retreat with the board of directors two years ago is that we're going to get to 100 percent employment of all of our clients so let's talk about the person like my son mm -hmm. uh, he is working right now which is great mm -hmm. and we all talk about how it's easier to get a job when you have a job. Yes. But what about someone who just came home from prison with no job? Or what about someone who was laid off for COVID? Right. I mean, I, I'm experienced. I mean, and that's why also I think when people look at, uh, you know, about getting a job or, mm -hmm. you know, what I get is because I was laid off. Mm -hmm. I mean, I get, I'm overqualified. Mm -hmm. I mean, I cannot, I could not get a job at a retail store right now or even a fast food because yeah. they would look at my resume and say, you're not sticking right. around. You're going to be here for about two. Thank you. No, thank you. Right. So there's lots of reasons right. why people are uh, unemployed or, or can't right. get a job. Right. It's right. not just because um, they, you know, don't speak English mm -hmm. or they um, were in prison. Right. I mean, right. and people don't realize that it's all across the board. Yeah. Or the other thing that I am experiencing right now is ageism. Right. Because right. I joke, I am a middle-aged mm -hmm. and also you know based on race mm -hmm. you know i'm a middle-aged white over-educated expensive person mm -hmm. nobody is looking at me right and then i'm facing this right now mm -hmm. you know i don't necessarily need someone to teach me the cues about interviewing or writing a resume right, right, or a cover right, letter right but um uh, but still it's you know i've been this is what i've been struggling mm -hmm. with for the last year and mm -hmm. so when the you know, they say, oh, they're going to get rid of this extra money that the government was giving you because these people don't are sitting home and don't want to work. I'm like, hello, I'm one of those people. <laughs> right. <laughs> so I think that's also what we have to sort of also shift is that right. understanding of who it is. Now, yes, your resources would be more for people who aren't as well educated or been working in a professional way for right. 30 years. Mm -hmm. But the barriers are still the barriers. Right. So yeah. Yes, you're right. 
and so you also, I mean, so you have, you're not only helping them teach them, but then you create businesses. So you, and mm -hmm. then also during COVID, you sort of pivoted because mm -hmm. then really nobody was working, right. but you really um, came up with a very innovative mm -hmm. idea. Tell me about that. Well, thank you. Uh, you know, it's a fun place to work, so uh, we're always pushing the envelope and making things better. We've been cleaning at the Embassy Theater for six years now. It's been an awesome relationship, I think six or seven cleaners, and a wonderful relationship. We've had a few failures, and uh, because they're a nonprofit arts-related organization, I don't know if you've ever met Kelly Updike. No, I have not. Oh my golly, you need to have her here. Okay. She is uh, one of a kind, but um, so so graceful, gracious with, with our clients. And, mm -hmm. you know, part of the journey for anyone's life is they're going to screw up. Mm -hmm. And it's having grace when they do screw up mm -hmm. and say, okay, you screwed up. Here's your consequence. And, oh, by the way, we're not going to judge you anymore for it. Let's move forward. Right. And that's the other thing, because when you, you know, I always say, People will say they forgive you, mm -hmm. but they don't forget. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, yeah. there's really that, there's, it's always conditional. Because right. even like when you're, you you know, even like, even when you argue with your wife or your, you know, mm -hmm. somebody, and then you say, and do you remember when you did it? And you're like, wait a minute, I thought we resolved that issue. So there is that, that people, when you say you're going to give them a second chance, yeah. you've got to really mm -hmm. step up and mean it. Because right. we don't. We right. may say it, but mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, it's really kind of cool when uh, you're able to hire people on staff who are actually graduates who needed a second chance. Right. So uh, you know it's part of the ethos. It's part of the culture. It's who we are. Right. So, uh, we, yeah, we created a cleaning business. In fact, we made a phone call to Fullinger Foundation and said, hey, we have this crazy hair brain idea. So you talked about businesses, social enterprise, that's what we want to do. Right. So 80, 80, right now, 85% of the people that go through our program are employed. Mm -hmm. That means there's another 15% of the people who aren't. Right. That means they're sitting and, at and home. And for the 80% that are employed, what kinds of jobs are we talking about? I mean, are they... It, it's across the board. Okay. It's across the board. So they're interact. So they're not... So these are not just typically what people would think are in a, on a factory line mm -hmm, or mm -hmm. working, you know, putting widgets together. Right, right. I mean, these could be people who are interacting with the public or doing mm -hmm. uh, service or mm -hmm. restaurants yes. or cooking. Or So it's across the board mm -hmm. of the, and it's also across the board of, it's from uh, entry level or mm -hmm. no, a, a no higher education required to probably people right. like me. Yes, who, you're right. Yeah. You're right. It, right. Yes. And that's also what's important to, mm -hmm. for people to understand. Yeah. The, it, we're, not, uh, we're not looking for just entry-level work all the right. time. That's what we want to build in-house is okay. the entry-level work. Right. We want to build that in-house. So, so they that, get that experience like right. your son right. so that then he can go yes. and say, right, well, that's also partly what internships used mm -hmm. to be or yes. apprenticeships yes. used to be, mm -hmm. which, you know, uh, for lots of reasons, some people do them, some don't, right. but that's, we used to have apprenticeship right. programs. Right. And, uh, and those apprenticeship programs often are subsidized by government funds, right? Right. So when there's a realignment of focus or realignment of priorities, right. those apprenticeship dollars just kind of right. fizzle away. Or there's too many hoops to jump through for an employer to say, okay, I'll take that grant to be able to take this person on as an apprentice. Right. No, Which is why also when we talk about this idea mm -hmm. that you can you have to be a for non profit but a for profit right. within a non profit yes. because let's say that's why I was asking you like with the programs mm -hmm. at Allen County Corrections because even if you had a, this really incredible program and you were proving that right. you were you know recidivism was down yeah. eighty percent yeah they'd be like well we don't have the budget right. for it right. sorry right. And so this way, so that, that you really are also creating these ways that you're mm -hmm. getting, because you said that um, with the cleaning business, originally mm -hmm. you weren't charging for it, correct? Or you were? We've always charged oh. the Embassy Theater. Okay. So uh, when COVID did hit, though, we did get a grant for it. And, um, and so here's what, here's what, it's a crazy thing that happened. So when I mentioned Pioneer Human Services, we, uh, we went out to Portland, we meaning this contingency of, from Fort Wayne, we went out to Portland, Oregon, and we saw all these sites that had these social enterprises that were in business for the purpose of hiring people with barriers to employment. Mm -hmm. And that blew me away. Mm -hmm. It's uh, just the concept of a social enterprise. Mm -hmm. What is a social enterprise? Mm -hmm. Well, it's, it could be a for-profit or it could be a non-profit. Mm -hmm. the, probably the most famous for-profit is Ben and Jerry's. Mm -hmm. They go into business for and sell a good mm -hmm. to the general public, mm -hmm. and with those proceeds or profits, they fund social good, right? right. They fund social good. Right. 
Then there are social enterprises that go into business as a means to fund their initiative. Okay. So, like the Chicago Ballet, the okay. child, children's ballet. Right. They own a number of Starbucks downtown in in the Chicago Greater Chicago area. You think are they hiring the 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 uh, the children that are in the ballet? No, they're not. They're hiring people off the street. But the proceeds from the Starbucks right. fund helps to fund because right. you can't just rely on your donors right. and grants. You right. can't. You can't. In, no business. I mean, that's like saying that I'm going to rely on. Um, you know, it's like just waiting. So the customers come in the door without it doing any marketing right. or promotion. That's I right. mean, you can't rely on, and you also can't have even as a like as a consultant. I always say I can't only be have a business of a consultant because then mm -hmm. I'm beholden to those contracts. Yes. So I also have to have things that I own, right. so that if I lose all those contracts, I still have yep. an income. Yep. And that's and that's a healthy diversification right. of income. Right. So, uh, so here we've had a, we have had a, an alternative staffing agency for literally eleven years. Okay. So the alternative staffing agency is like a temp agency in house. Right. So they go through the career academy, and people who need our, our assistance, there are a lot of people who don't need our assistance. They're highly marketable. They got what they needed from our program, and they go out and get a job right away. Okay. Then there's other people that may need some additional assistance, and right. so. Jennifer and Aaron at my, at my office will sit down with them and they'll say, okay, what is it that you're looking for? Let's see if we right. have a cache of employers right. that are available to place. So isn't that like what Gigi's Playhouse does with its, um, you know, it has that smoothie bar. Mm -hmm. And so that was, they turned, they created that to give, that's for um, people with, uh, who, uh, who have mm -hmm. uh, Down syndrome. Yeah. And then they can, they have a place that's a, it's like a restaurant you mm -hmm. can get smoothies and stuff. And now they've actually created where they're actually putting their products into the, uh, at uh, different uh, healthier products mm -hmm. in uh, the, the coolers at uh, gas mm -hmm. stations. Mm -hmm. So, and again, then they use that fund, yep. also the revenue to support. Yep. So, Gigi's is brilliant. So that's an example. Mm -hmm. So, so, so when you're saying that, um, when you look at, this social enterprise or the mm -hmm. creating this um, business mm -hmm. entity for people. So what kinds of, um, so obviously cleaning, mm -hmm. you know, that. Yeah. what other kinds of businesses are you looking at or? Um, Good question. So, um, so I, just to really kind of button up that, the, the cleaning, we had 18 people that were working at various companies. I mm -hmm. think 15 companies when COVID hit and everyone's getting laid off. So we very quickly pivoted and said, okay, what do we do well? What do we know? And right. we know cleaning. So uh, the, the Flinger Foundation stepped in and said, hey, I'll fund those 18 mm -hmm. people. Let's send them out and start cleaning. So we did deep sanitizing, right. deep cleans right. uh, um, for all nonprofits for free and churches locally, uh, religious institutions mm -hmm. for free. And that was really cool. And then the city of Fort Wayne stepped in month two and month three and said, I, wanna, I want this to continue. And so uh, $25,000 a month. Uh, and that 25000 it actually it costs us $26,000. did not matter. It it paid for it people's paid enough wages. That you could, right, right. So and they the, were getting. And you were talking about a living wage. I mean, whatever. Yeah. I mean, what were you paying an hour? I don't know. It was uh, ten, eleven. Okay. Um, and, and they were very happy to do it because they they were cleaning places that were like community harvest. I mean, right. they were active. I mean, they were open. They had to be open. They had to be cleaned. They had to be turned over and sanitized consistently. Right. And, so our our um, and now employees, you're continuing that even now, right? I mean, is all the funding for it gone? Yeah, the funding's been gone since July of last year. Um, but we picked up uh, opportunities with five companies to be able to continue cleaning mm -hmm. with them for a fee for service. Mm -hmm. So that's kept about seven additional people. Mm -hmm. So about thirteen. So then you also have to have people though who could go out and let other companies know that you have this service. We haven't and, really marketed it. Ah, okay. And so this is with our relationships. And, okay. And and and. The, we fall upon these enterprises, uh, and they end up working. Right. Uh, we test them out. Uh, we try to make the clothing store awesome. Right. Uh, our customer service experience is incredible. Mm -hmm. If you ever shop there, you'll 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 see the stories that are really tangible. Mm -hmm. Just like Jeezy's Playhouse. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're doing it well. They're mm -hmm. generating income to mm -hmm. fund their mission. Mm -hmm. They're selling a product, right. and it keeps people employed. Right. So that's our our purpose. Okay. So the fifteen percent right now that are unemployed, we want them to work at our clothing store our cleaning service and we're investigating by August to launch something that'll be on our campus on and South you can't, Calhoun. And you can't say Well, uh, we've talked about it a lot, but uh, actually we've had consultants in from Seattle uh, and we have a local consultant as well. Uh, we're we're going to launch a cafe. Uh -huh. So it'll be a neighborhood cafe mm -hmm. and it's an easy entry into that market. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not a restaurateur, I'm not a clothing right. store retailer right. either. Right. but. 
uh, we, ha I, we feel like we have the right people and that'll provide up to seven additional jobs. Mm -hmm. So we look at the numbers uh, in cleaning, in clothing, mm -hmm. and in a potential cafe, and we feel like we'll close the gap and, and get as many people employed as possible. Those who are, when we look at virtually unemployable, they'll be employable after they get some experience with right. us. So they'll have uh, an opportunity to have a job coach if they need one. Um, so they graduate the Career Academy. And the really cool thing is we had two different lines. We had one called our Adapted Career Academy. That was for everyone with an intellectual or developmental mm -hmm. disability mm -hmm. and our traditional Career Academy. Mm -hmm. We thought to ourselves, why do we have two separate lines if we're asking the employer to, to merge and integrate everyone? Right. So uh, this past month, we made the decision, why are we not integrating everyone in the same classroom? So and if now, they need more help, you mm -hmm. just provide them tutors? Or that's right. And that's our, that's our, teacher, our teacher's aid and job coach. Right. Yep. Mm -hmm. so, so I'm curious to know when, with everything that you've looked at and really looking at giving people a second chance and this whole idea of understanding reward and you know punishment and everything, mm -hmm. how has that um, impacted you as a parent? Hmm. Well, uh, I I say that I fail as a parent every day, so <laughs> mm -hmm. um, I think it's nice to have grace. Um, because uh, they say that punishment doesn't work. I mean, it right. doesn't work in time. You know, sometimes you just need to take a chill, but right. but punishment and doesn't work. And so I'm just right. wondering how you are really understanding in the psychology and, and, you know, dealing with a lot of people who are also different trauma and different circumstances right. that, you know, in some cases it's beyond their control of mm -hmm. how they got to where they are. Um, I was just wondering how that and how that um, how does that then also interact with how you lead the mm -hmm. organization and the people you, that work with you? Yeah, well, I, 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 perhaps you see my passion about what I do, but yeah. um, I really love my job. Uh, but I'm also very thankful that I get to work it. In in so doing. Um, it's hard for me to imagine me being where I am without the grace of God. It's hard for me to imagine being thrust in a position of leadership and, and having, parent, or having kids. Um, I don't deserve kids, and I don't deserve the opportunity to lead a nonprofit. I don't. I mean, I'm, I'm as broken and fallible as any other human being but that you'll meet. But maybe that gives you the EQ and those sort of subtleties to be able to bring in that compassion and understanding mm -hmm. and, and being able to truly, truly give someone a second chance. Yeah. I mean, maybe you need to, that's what you needed, you need to have in order to be able to do that. I think so. I think it helps. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I um, you know, I, I've, so I actually used to work at the Boys and Girls Club. So I came home from undergrad and I worked there for six months or something like that. And in fact, uh, there was a kid who was approaching 18 years of age helping. Uh, he he um, ended up becoming a Blue Jacket graduate. And, and uh, he came back and he volunteered. We were doing some work yesterday um, at another nonprofit. So we have this big trailer from the Fantasy Lights, and we were moving uh -huh. uh, a partner nonprofit. And, and we were waiting for some things to happen. And he turned to me and he was like, Tony, do you remember when you called the cops on me? At, at Boys and Girls Club, when I was th throwing pool balls at uh, another another one of the uh, Boys and Girls Club kids, and mm -hmm. he was like, "Yeah, you've been on my butt ever since." And uh, and it was really kind of funny. But he came back. He he graduated from Blue Jacket. And he has an incredible job now. Um, he makes a lot. Of, he does well. Mm -hmm. But um, you know, he he's confessed to me that he struggles with mental health. Mm -hmm. um, and the neat thing is that all of my staff, I think, lead with love. Mm -hmm. um, I love my coworkers, and mm -hmm. I think they love me. Mm -hmm. I, 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 and it sounds really cliche to mm -hmm. say, hey, I'm a grown man and I love you. Mm -hmm. uh, and sometimes we do. Mm -hmm. um, it, we actually lost a, a colleague um, suddenly to a heart attack last year. She was our case manager, graduate of the program and went off and got two degrees, came back and worked for us as a case manager mm -hmm. and suddenly passed away and, and we realized life is so short. We told each other a lot mm -hmm. how much we loved each mm -hmm. other more often. Mm -hmm. um, and, and 
and I think God puts those things in our in our in our path to mm -hmm. um, to develop our culture. Mm -hmm. But I like the fact that you also like don't diminish the fact that you're very resourceful because you said like you have this truck that you use for Fantasy of Lights. Well, right. that's not being used right now, but some, another nonprofit needs to move. Yeah. And so you could pivot. And I mean, I think that's also being able to really utilize your resources. And I think that that's like, just like you said with the clothing and you open now, you have two stores, right? The, just one. Just one? Yeah. But I think it's so great how you can pivot in that way mm -hmm. or the cleaning service. Or I think that that's really also um, having that sense of flexibility. Mm -hmm. um, so. We wouldn't be able to do all this if we didn't have an innovative board of directors. Right. We wouldn't be able to do this if, I mean, we have three accountants on the board, um, but they are incredible human beings that, um, that embrace that I, I, I'm somewhat entrepreneurial. I love to take risk. I love to generate income. I love to not be dependent. I don't know if you know this or not. When we first started, we got a huge Department of Labor grant. Almost 75% of our funding come, came through this grant. Three-year uh, renews and we decided to turn our backs on those funds. We are almost all government funded, government grant funded. And it wasn't a bad or good thing, but it didn't fit us very well. And it was making us serve, it, for example, it was telling us that we couldn't serve the violent right. offenders. Well, we want to serve people who have violent offenses. I right, because certain grants come with certain conditions. Right, and those conditions didn't fit us, right. didn't fit our, our right. mold. So uh, we're now 0% government grant funded and uh, earned income, I, I really love being able to make the money rather than, uh, it's not my style to beg for the money in a sense. Right. Uh, but we are getting better at that. We're allowing a lot more people to step into opportunities to, to give. Mm -hmm. uh, sponsorships mm -hmm. and uh, Fantasy Lights is mm -hmm. huge. Yep. Fantasy Lights, we hire, what, 18 of our clients to run it. Mm -hmm. uh, we expanded into a big Christmas market this right. year. A lot of fun things are happening. So. Uh, the board really embraces it being entrepreneurial. I don't think we'd be able to pivot so quickly right. if the board wasn't uh, on board. But, you know, the cool thing is we have our eyes on the strategic plan. We know what we want to do this year. We want, know what we want to do in five years. And our eyes never come off of it. But as long as we're inside of what we want to be doing, right. we can change relatively quickly. Right. And that And that goal is to help those who were originally unemployable mm -hmm. to become yes. employable and to get jobs. Yes. Yep. So um, at the end of each And Good Company program, I ask guests the same 12 questions that were popularized by uh, the French novelist Marcel Proust. Mm. And he believed that these would, um, by answering these questions, we get to see somewhat into your true nature. What is your favorite word? Oh my, I'm not prepared for this. Nobody's prepared for it. It's supposed to be right off the top of your head. Well, uh, I just said the word love, so we'll okay. say that. What is your least favorite word? <laughs> uh, can we skip and come back to that? Is no, this a, is like a, not, a, a, no. the million Everybody dollar question? Pass, <laughs> but uh, uh. the N word. Okay. What turns you on creatively, spiritually, or emotionally? Hmm. Uh, my wife. Okay. What turns you <laughs> off, creatively, spiritually, or emotionally? Uh, uh, Narrow-mindedness. What sound or noise do you love? Birds. What sound or noise do you hate? Cars. What profession other than your own would you like to attempt? Well, I'm too old for it now, but an Air Force pilot would be great. What profession would you not like to do? Hmm. Clean urinals. <laughs> or uh, 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 um, the outhouses. Uh -huh. Oh, yeah, those oh, for that the construction people yeah, work? Yeah. yeah. What do you consider your greatest achievement? Uh, my wife, uh, being able to marry her. Who, living or dead, would you most like to have a conversation with? Martin Luther King. Junior. How would you like to die? Wrestling a bear. <laughs> if heaven exists, what would you like to hear God say when you arrive at the pearly gates? Uh, it does exist and uh, job well done. 
Well, I want to thank you for giving us just a little insight into all that you're doing, but really looking in a new way of thinking about service and being a nonprofit, I think is really uh, commendable and important. Thank you. So thank you very much. Thank you. And you can learn more about Anne Good Company and all the other interesting conversations we have had at andgoodcompany.info. And we look forward to next week when you can again enjoy a seat at the table for great conversation and good company.